Hey, everybody. Welcome to Daniel Davis Deep Dive coming to you live from Washington, D.C. Is Israel heading to another war? Is Israel not going to be attacked, but is Israel going to launch into another war and expand this conflagration that's already roiling half the Middle East? Is it going to get worse? Now, you would think it's just on the surface of it. Well, no one seeks war. No one's going to start another war when they're already in a huge one already. Are they? Well, to try to unravel this, we have uh, with us show favorite Matthew Ho, former State Department official, former combat Marine, good friend of mine, just all around great guy, definite star of the show. Welcome back, Matt. Uh, did I can't hear you there? Do we do we get some audio? I know I'm, I have muted Whoop. myself. Uh, there we go. Yeah, I don't want to mute you, man. Off mute. We I need know. to hear what you have to say. Because you're the one that's going to help us make a lot of sense out of something that just doesn't seem like it makes a lot of sense on the surface. Uh, but that's uh, that, that does seem to be where things are heading right now. Now, obviously, there's so many things we could talk about in terms of the Middle East writ large or, or even just the Israeli Hamas war that's going on right now. But we want to take a look at the potential for this thing to expand, not by accident or miscalculation or anything else, but by design into the north of Israel, into Lebanon against Hezbollah. Now, lest anybody thinks that this is hyperbole, uh, yesterday we had uh, a right uh, politician, Ben Gavir, uh, mm -hmm. who said that actually Israel should start a war against Hezbollah in southern Lebanon as a preemptive attack. I mean, that's the, we, we certainly got a lot of, that sounds very Bush-esque, about, yeah, mm -hmm. let's just prevent attack here. And, and of course, Matt, as I think you could talk to in a second here, uh, a lot of people uh, say that, you know, well, we can't take care of Hamas here and then leave uh, Hezbollah in the north. We have to take care of one and then take care of the other, or maybe try to do both simultaneously. I don't know. But also yesterday, a three-star uh, Israeli general said this. <laughs> זה להחזיר את התושבים לצפון, כל היישובים בצפון. אנחנו מבינים שהדבר הזה חייב לעבור דרך שינוי מאוד משמעותי. אני לא יודע מתי המלחמה בצפון. אני יודע להגיד לכם שהסבירות לזה שהיא קורית בחודשים הקרובים, וכשנצטרך אנחנו נלך קדימה בכל הכוח. Now, I'm sure, Matt, they are not just saying this to, just to kind of... I don't know, make headlines. I mean, I think that they're trying to lay the foundation here so nobody's surprised when it comes. And and also, just a, a few weeks ago, you had another member of, of uh, Netanyahu's government that said that uh, that uh, Israel should have to reoccupy southern Lebanon for another 50 years. So everywhere you look, all across their government, and that's the key thing here, this is not rumors, this is not what somebody said or what we're reading the tea leaves. These are statements by senior-ranking government and military officials Everything is pointing to Israel going in, into the north. What do you make of this, and what do you think would happen? Well, you know, this, this has been, <clears throat> this is the example of a Pandora's box being opened. All sorts of things have come out of this. Some desired, some unwanted, some foreseen, some not foreseen. You take, for example, the, the, the three-star general you just were showing the, 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 <clears throat> the quote from, you know, he mentioned something that's very important. Uh, there's more than 100,000 Israelis who've been displaced from their communities in northern Israel. They're staying in hotels in Tel Aviv and in Haifa and other places. I mean, that's a tremendous impact on a society of 8 million people to have more than 100,000 people displaced. You also have the economic consequences of all, all this, whether it be the, the uh, Houthi attacks on shipping in the Red Sea that have disrupted uh, uh, you know, shipping coming to Israel. Israel is very dependent upon shipping for a lot of different aspects of its economy and society. But also, too, the call up of a few hundred thousand reservists has caused... Um, has caused, uh, uh, you know, as you can imagine, again, a country of 8 million people, and you call up a large chunk of them into your reserves, that's going to have a big impact on your economy. People are missing from work, basically. You yeah. have the entire economy of northern Gaza and, I'm mean, sorry, of northern Israel and southern Israel shut down, uh, basically, because of the, the genocide that Israel is choosing to, to conduct in Gaza, as well as what's occurring uh, in, in northern Israel and with Lebanon. So just like that one aspect, if you just look on the economic side of this, the pressure 
that is on the Israeli government to do something to remedy the situation is massive. But that's just one aspect. And it doesn't have as much importance in terms of the decision making of many of the people at the top as the political decisions making. You showed comments there from, again, very important people in Israel, not just, uh, you know, random folks, but very important people, people in senior government positions who are desirous of uh, launching a war into Lebanon. There, there's the prime minister certainly can see the upshot of it because he knows as soon as the war in Gaza is over, he's out of power. Israelis want him out of power. And very likely he could be going to prison because of all the corruption he engaged in. So he has yeah, that, that, uh, that, right? that, that uh, trial is actually still ongoing. It, they, they restarted right. that not too long ago. So that's burning in the background and certainly a factor right. in, in Netanyahu. And then you have this desire, you hear that, that last quote from Liberman uh, say, talking about how we should reoccupy Lebanon, which is, I think this is where, you know, a lot of us are saying, what is going on here? This is, is madness uh, to reoccupy. I mean, if people who aren't familiar with the um, uh, uh, occupation of Lebanon that Israel conducted from 1982 to, I think it was 2002, uh, they pulled out, um, it was just a horror show for Israel. I mean, absolute horror show in so many ways for, for Lebanon, of course, you know, and Lebanese people took a terrible, terrible, uh, the, 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 what befell them was awful from that. But for Israel itself, it was a disaster. I mean, the very, you know, nothing less significant than this is how Hezbollah was created was because of the Israel. I mean, so you have these prominent people saying we should do it again. You know, maybe this time we'll get it right which is what you hear in the American foreign policy establishment, right? I mean, we certainly heard this, Danny, when you and I were arguing against escalating the war in Afghanistan. Well, we learned from Vietnam, we learned from Iraq. So this time we are definitely going to get it right in Afghanistan. Yeah, right? yeah. I mean, I'm going to mention that again here in a second. Uh, but, but let me ask you this, though. So even in, in Netanyahu's best case scenario, if things worked out exactly the way he wanted, uh, he's talking about there's going to have to be an, an extended uh, Israeli occupation of Gaza as it is, and probably even more uh, more aggressive in the West Bank, which is, you know, three million, I believe, is the number of people who live right. in that area there, on top of potentially now setting up this case for doing the same thing in the southern part of Lebanon. I mean, you talked about how much challenge this is already causing with the Israeli economy because of the diversion of so many people from the workforce into the army. If you did an occupation force, you would need substantially more troops than you have now. How can anything, how can Israel even sustain this long term? I mean, it seems to me they are setting the stage for their self-destruction. Well, you know, and the the folly of it, the logic of it, the, the you know, this is, this is again, but you see where the Israeli military fought, fails like the um, American military fails. There's just such hubris, the, 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 the politics of who's running the organizations, how they get to the top, these generals, who they represent, uh, who their benefactors are outside of the military, so who's advancing their cause. I mean, it's just not a, a, a cadre of, of intelligent, uh, objective uh, analysts. It's people who have political desires, who have ideological beliefs, who have a religious zealotry that want to see some type of destiny fulfilled. Uh, but there's also two things you, you'll get, come across these. Well, we're going to go into Lebanon and we'll occupy Lebanon up into the Latani River and push Hezbollah out. That, you know, that might be great if all Hezbollah had was Katusha rockets that fired 15 miles or whatever, but they don't. I mean, how far do you have to go into Lebanon? How much of Lebanon do you have to occupy to make Haifa and Tel Aviv safe from Hezbollah rockets. You have to push almost Probably all, all of it. I, I mean, exactly. I exactly. Yeah, I mean, I, and so, so what will you get out of this? What kind of security, this idea, but there is so entrenched in this mindset among both the religious zealots in Israel and the, 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 the ultra nationalists, the, the more secular security types of this buffer state. So whether it's a greater Israel or a buffer around Israel, uh, you know, what does that actually accomplish? What would it really, what does it mean in practice? You're talking about the commitment it would put on Israel in terms of manpower, in terms of what percent of its economy, what percent of its government spending is now going to support this. What do you get out of it? 
but politics trumps all of this. And, you know, I well, mean, that, that's the reality. Well, it can trump all of it while you're making these kind of decisions. But but if the consequences of these things for the population itself. Now, we're going to talk in a minute about the, the implication and the, the horrific uh, uh, consequences on the Palestinian population. I don't want to forget about that. Mm -hmm. But for the moment, just look at the Israeli population. I mean, these kind of policies are going to bankrupt their country and make them far more insecure than they were on 6th of October than they are now. Absolutely. <clears throat> Completely isolated, uh, but from the rest of the world, uh, except for the United States, which the Israelis uh, who are in favor of these policies say that doesn't matter. All we need is the United States. As long as we have the United States and the world's reserve currency backing us to hell with the rest of the world. And we could see that in their actions. We could see that basically the way they presented themselves at the International Court of Justice. Uh, last Friday, their arguments were not a legal argument. So it was like a public relations argument. They were they were reinforcing their message to their people as well as to their supporters with the with the U.S. giving justification for the continued support of Israel. But you're right, Danny. So you're talking about some kind of occupation in Gaza. Uh, the IDF and Netanyahu himself just said it again a day or two ago. We will fight throughout 2024 in Gaza. So you're looking at the the. Uh, uh, you're looking at combat operations by the IDF in Gaza uh, through the rest of the year. Uh, you have 3 million people uh, in the West Bank. Uh, 300 some odd people have been killed since October 7th by Israeli security services and settlers. Settlers are evicting people from their homes, burning their olive olive tree groves, uh, you know, just just trying to, to, to capture villages. Uh, you, so you're, you're on the verge of a third intifada by the Palestinians in the West Bank. And the West Bank, of course, which is what the uh, Zionists in Israel, those who are pushing these policies, call uh, uh, um, <coughs> Judea and Samaria, that's their goal. You know, Gaza is important, Matt, Matt, them, I'm but sorry, not nearly as important as, 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 as I, I hear that term a lot, and, and I'm, I don't know if all of our uh, viewers uh, understand that. When you say an intifada, I know there's there's I hear a lot about the first intifada and the second intifada, yeah. and you're talking about a potential another one. What is an intifada as contrasted with whatever's going on right now? Well, intifada intifada uh, is, translates as revolution. Uh, so that's what you're talking about. You're talking about a revolution. So in 1987, you have the first intifada, which many people will remember the Palestinians uh, out on the street, actively, physically opposing uh, the Israeli occupation becomes very violent. Uh, the violence throughout the 90s against the Israelis by the Palestinians, you know, violence being done as a form of resistance because occupation includes the suicide bombings, right? So you have uh, Israeli civilians taking very uh, horrific casualties in these awful suicide bombings, again, done as an act of resistance against the occupation. Israel's response, of course, was very, very heavy handed, very brutal. You have the second intifada uh, in 2000. Has led to the rise of Hamas. Well, with Hamas comes in 1987. Uh, so Hamas, uh, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Hamas. Well, the origins of Hamas go before that. They do that, but they got they got elected in 2005 as a result of that, right? It, right. That so the result? What, one of the things that Israel does is that up until that point, 2005. Israel, since 1967, has been physically occupying Gaza. They've got army units there and they have settlers, about 9,000 settlers, who controlled about 40% of Gaza's uh, land, these 9,000 people, uh, including the best agricultural land, of course, the best spots on the coast, etc. cetera. Uh, so when Israel pulls out in 2005, it's this idea that we are taking some pressure off. We're not a visible presence in Gaza, as opposed to the West Bank, where they remained in full force. Uh, but what what we'll do then now is we'll control Gaza because it's not nearly as important to us as the West Bank. We will control Gaza uh, by fire, basically. So we will, yeah. we will have a, a air, land and sea blockade on them. We will control everything going out. We built the infrastructure. We still control the infrastructure. So if they want any water, their water is coming from us. If they want to go fishing, we got they've got to get our approval. All the I mean, so the occupation still existed after Israel pulled out its troops and settlers, yeah, just to buy in a different form. So it went from being a, a occupied in a traditional sense to what's you know referred to as an open air concentration camp. I see. Basically. I see. Yeah. Okay. Now I don't I, I ask you about the the uh you know the potential third intifada, but I want to hold that for a second because I want a couple things I want to discuss first and then we'll get back to that. But the next thing I do want to talk about is in light of all the stuff that we've talked about so far, 
man, you talk about some just some ideological or, or blinders in, in terms of policy making. Man, you got you can't look much further than Washington D.C. Yesterday in Washington, our Secretary of State uh, was on talking. Well, I'll let him speak for himself, and then we'll talk on the backside. Unlike any time in the past, virtually all of its neighbors, uh, its Arab neighbors, its Muslim neighbors, are prepared, indeed want to integrate Israel into the region. And they're prepared to give it the kind of security assurances and commitments and guarantees that they never would have given in the past. But they're equally committed to a pathway to a Palestinian state because they believe strongly, and we believe as well, that until that question is resolved, you're never really going to have peace and stability. Uh, sorry, that was actually in Davos, but it was yesterday. Uh, but the, <laughs> let's get back to the. I was, I was, I was, you know, I forgot that the World Economic Forum was going on. I was like, why are they interviewing him outside in Washington D.C.? I did because it was snowing, and the, so it looked just like it. But uh, That's right, the WEF is going on. Let's, yeah. let's not get past the naughty, the nuttiness of it. Uh, him saying that. You know, never before has the Middle East wanted to give Israel security concerns. And I'm thinking, are you serious? Since 10-7, you think it's better now than it was before that? I mean, that doesn't make any sense on any level, first of all. Yeah. But then then the, the the rest of it that he's talking about that, you know, the the uh the, you know, everybody is is trying to get this done. We want to move past it. Um you know, he's making it sound so simple and like, man, all they do to do, but there's a two state. We just now we actually have to do a two state. And I think there's so much more to it than that, of course. But to me, Matt, you can't get into any of these genuinely hard issues when your mentality is, yeah, man, everybody wants to do what Israel wants to do. They just they're, they embrace it. I, I think this is similar to what we've seen with the American policy towards Ukraine is that it's a strategy based on hope. So just obfuscate, delay, gaslight, lie, do whatever you can to stretch this out. And eventually it'll be over. And then we can spin it, right? We can spin, I mean, you could spin it in a sense of as they do. I mean, President Biden is going to be here in Raleigh today. I, I imagine uh, he, if he gets asked about Gaza, which is unlikely unless protesters disrupt him. And so I hope they do. He will say how we're doing everything we can to make sure Israel's following the laws of war, how we are doing everything we can. We're being very forceful with them to make to get them out of Gaza as soon as possible. You know, just just nonsense, just absolute nonsense. And that's how we need to treat this. I mean, we're dealing with psychopaths. I mean, if you could if you can have these people who say things such as we are doing everything we can to protect civilians in Gaza, to get to make sure that Israelis are following rules of, of war, all, all those sorts of things, while at the same time uh, bypassing Congress to make sure they get bombs and shells as quickly as possible, sending like three C-17s a day of shells and missiles and, and, and you know, uh, munitions to, you know, a cargo ship every two or three days. You know, these are psychopaths. I mean, and that's all that's how we have to view them as. And this is why this is so dangerous, because they will say anything uh, to just they the, the worry for me, Danny, is how much of this is actually believed, how much of this is actually what they understand the world as. You know, do they really believe this? And that's that's then incredible. Well, let me, let me tell you one of my concerns uh, related to that is that what even if we believed it, and let's just give them the benefit of the doubt for the moment and say that they actually mean those things. And that's what we want. And we we are emphatically, as Kirby says often, you know, we are telling the Israelis, you know, they've got to do better at this and they are doing better at, at you know, at minimizing uh, civilian casualties. You know, they're taking a, a, a robust intelligence direction toward these targeting so that they minimize all the kind of stuff. And then you have Netanyahu come out and say something like what I'm about to show you here, which is basically y'all can all pound sand. Yeah. <laughs>
Now, this is why I wanted to hold off on the discussion about the potential for a third intifada, uh, because what Netanyahu is saying here sounds eerily similar to what uh, Barack Obama said in December 2009 when he said, we are going to go into Afghanistan heavy so that Afghanistan can never again be used as a platform of terrorism against the United States, and we're going to destroy the Taliban. How did that work out about a decade later? And God only knows how many tens of thousands of casualties right. on the both sides of that conflict, hundreds of thousands of Americans with PTSD, traumatic brain injuries, you know, combat injuries, and it ended in with nothing. Now, that was, I think, about a three in comparison to the nine in terms of violence and potential mm -hmm. that we have in the Israeli situation here. And if I, because here's my thing and where I want you to go with this, what could come next? Netanyahu, again, there expressly said one of his objectives is the destruction of Hamas. OK, let's say that miraculously they somehow do that. I don't I don't think it's even possible to physically eliminate. But let's say that somehow they literally killed everybody that was Hamas and all of that carnage that we keep seeing over and over and on our daily television screens about this destruction of Hamas, uh, of the civilian infrastructure there. And we're going to show something really disturbing here in a minute. But if there is, in fact, another uh, intifada me in de the definition you gave, which is they're going to rebel against you, what are the chances that after Hamas is gone, that the remainder of the surviving people don't do that? Uh, about zero. Uh, about zero. Right, Danny? I mean, like, what would you do? What would anyone watching do? What is history? I mean, just look at that image. Right? That, that, that's yeah. that's everywhere in the Gaza Strip. Everything has been wiped out so that you can't sustain life. Now, even if Hamas is destroyed, where is all of the hundreds of, the, well, the millions of people who lived in those areas, what are they going to do? Live in a tent the rest of their lives and be passive? I mean, what are they thinking, man? Yeah, I mean, you know, the, this this is, I think what we're seeing here is a, a really driving effort to achieve the, a goal of Israeli policy for decades, right? This type of, finish the Gaza problem. If we can ethnically cleanse the area, if we can push these 2.3 million people into Egypt, into the Sinai. Which and we, Smotrich wants to do, for example. Exactly. It's a lot of money. Yeah, exactly. It's Smotrich, uh, ben Gavir. I mean, the whole yeah. list of, you know, and um, if we're, we can, you know, this is the time to do it. We will never have a better chance than now to do it. I want to go back to what I was saying about blinking though, real quick, because uh, you know, we can call them psychopaths, which there is that that aspect to it. But there's also the hard realities of power here, the hard realities of our political system and the way that the Israel lobby has its effect on American politics can't be dismissed. And it has to be considered as a, as a prime factor in all this. Uh, Joe Biden knows that if he was to uh, tell Netanyahu to stop this war, the Israel lobby would shift all its support to the Republican, quite possibly bring another candidate into the race through the no labels campaign. And that would effectively, as far as the White House estimation, estimation is, lose the election for Joe Biden. I mean, and the same thing, too, you see with how the Israeli lobby, primarily AIPAC, is saying it's going to spend $100 million to defeat House candidates this cycle who have argued for a ceasefire. So this is very hard reality of our political system. This is the political system that people like Biden and, and uh, Blinken exist in. This is, this is their survival. And I think on the other aspect, hearing Netanyahu talk about these things, um, the way he looks at this is this type of war gives his, his government meaning. It certainly distracts, of course, from all the corruption and crime they were involved in distracts, of course, from the judicial reforms they were trying to push through, which brought what, again, Israel's got about 8 million people and a million of them was a million of them were on the street, you know, six, seven months ago, protesting against these judicial reforms. So this is allows the government of Netanyahu to survive. And this is why, again, going back to Lebanon, the idea that if they can somehow sequence it, and make it so Gaza's finished and now we can then begin Lebanon, that would be great for their survival. It extends everything. But I don't, you know, that's not, I don't think that's possible to manage. I mean, we saw uh, uh, already uh, where the Israelis pulled out a section of Gaza and Hamas fired rockets from it. 
So that's going to be the type of thing. And anytime the Israelis let up on their northern boundary with uh, Hezbollah, Hezbollah is going to do something to pull the Israelis back because they want to help take pressure off of Gaza as much as possible without incurring some type of full-blown in Israeli invasion. So they, they want this tit-for-tat thing in many ways. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the, the, what we're seeing here with the interests that are involved and what is best politically for the people who are making these decisions, what their own political survival stance you know, uh, requires, what their political party survival requires, what their institutions need yeah, is driving so much of this. Um, and it's almost it, it's not as if they have a decision because, again, the political structure that they exist in, the, ha how they are surviving politically is a construct that has long been built. So it's not just as if, uh, you know, the White House woke up and, oh, man, we have this Israeli lobby we've got to contend with. Oh, where did this come from? This has been constructed for decades. And so for decades, both Democrats, and Republicans have loved taking that lobby money. But yeah. now in the see with the what Biden administration, they have no choice. They have to support Israel. To this well, degree. there's also other ideologies. Don't give him that much of an out. He has a choice. He money does have no money. Yeah. They can do the right thing. Because right. here's here's one of my overall driving issues with this, Matt, is that you have let's just look at some of the key actors here. You have the U.S. government, Blinken, Biden, uh, Austin, you know, several of these others. Uh, you have Netanyahu and, and Smotrich, Ben Gavir, and several of you know their uh, co-religionists and people who have their ideological. They do. You have you have Iran. You have Hezbollah. The, the terrorists that are out there. Uh, lots of violent people, uh, and all of these people are, are like finding ways that they want to get their side in. And all of them are willing to use violence equally. In the middle, you have the vast majority of Israeli civilians who just want to live. You right. have the millions of Palestinians who just want to live. They don't want any damn war. They are sick and tired of all of this and they want it to stop and they have no power. I, I know that there's lots of, of, of Jewish people who are protesting to, to end these wars. You know, they're, they're not at this. There is others, of course, that are telling the government to go harder. That's the reason why a right wing government was, was voted into power. So you have those dynamics. But the bottom line is, that all of these forces are pursuing something that can't be obtained. Nobody is going to get peace, not the Palestinians, not the Israelis, not the, the, the Houthis, not the Iranians. Nobody is going to have peace in there until somebody finally wakes up and says, all right, we're going to have to do something here. And I don't know. I, I mean, I can't even imagine in the current environment how that's going to happen, because I think, Matt, the chances are pretty high that the war does expand into Hezbollah in Lebanon. I think that there's a, a, a decent chance that Iran gets involved with this. And we already, we haven't even talked about the issue in the Red Sea with the Houthis and all the stuff that could be going on with that, or Khatib Hezbollah in Iraq, or, or the, some of the forces in Syria. You just see this as a powder keg. And I think like you mentioned before we went on the air here, now that you got Iran into Pakistan and Pakistan back and forth, this whole thing is about to explode. And, and every step, every decision that these different powers make limits future choices. So we, we, we saw this past week, uh, <clears throat> of course, they could make the decision, as you were saying, Danny, they have the choice to end it. They have the choice to step back. They have the choice to de-escalate. But, you know, escalation is, is a ladder, right? You got to go up or down. You can't go side to side. And, you know, so you saw this past week, the Israelis said, hey, we had a special operations team go into Lebanon and make a successful and do a successful mission. Well, what happens if the next time they do that, it's not successful and three or four of their commandos don't come home, three or four of their commandos end up on a Hezbollah video. What are the Israelis going to do? I mean, that was the precursor for uh, in the invasion into Lebanon in 2006, right? That was also had something to do with the 82 invasion. Uh, as well as incursions into pre in Gaza was about hostages. Certainly, this is the demand of the Israelis right now, or the hostages in Gaza. So what will happen if Israel could send another commando team, another special op operations unit into Lebanon, and this time it doesn't go so well? What or, are the options? Or, and what if an American warship gets hit with one of these Houthi missiles, slips through our defenses, and hits a warship, or an American is killed in Iraq, or an American right. is killed in Syria? The list just keeps going. 
we, we, you, you basically the, the the every step forward uh, escalatory you know gives less less options so that ladder is just not a vertical ladder but it's also almost like a pyramid right it's tapering because at least That's there a great, there's great less, analogy right left wrong space limited the higher you go it, you really you really are limited uh you know and then the pressures right. don't go away and it's not like and then those who want the war and there are those in DC in Absolutely. Tel Aviv in Lebanon in Iran I mean saying last night to some folks you know look the Iranians have their versions of John Bolton and John McCain just you know I mean they, they, yeah, everyone has hardliners Instagram yeah, yeah they it, got them all it, it, they do it, and so even the threats made against say Lebanon like at that many Israelis like including both the defense minister and the prime minister have said uh, we will we will do to Beirut what we have done to Khan Yunus or to Gaza City, right. right? I mean, even those threats, while for some people within Lebanon, that makes them, that doesn't cause people to take a step back. That takes causes people to take a step forward, right? Okay, you say you're going to do this, we're going to do this then, you know? Uh, and there are people who want to see something like that because they believe that for their own individual selves and for their institutions and their ideologies, war is the best thing. I mean, these people, I'd like to, th to think that we had gotten to a point in history where we didn't have such people in control of institutions and societies and nations, but we do. Um, yeah. I mean, and yeah. so let me ask you this, Matt, because right now you just painted a, a really accurate but distressing picture because it's not just, I mean, I wish it was just the hotheads in Washington, the, yeah. the, the Jack Keens and the, the Lindsey Grahams that we could just kind of quell but it's not. It's the Ben Gavirs. It's it's the the Lindsey Graham's. It's the guys in in uh, Iran. It's the guys in in the, the Yemen. All of these folks. They are in the head. Of course, you know uh, uh, the Hassan Nasrallah. He put him right. in the same category. All of them are just looking about violence. Now, left to their own devices, this can only end bad for everyone. Right now, there's no way. So, if you had any kind of an a, a I want to say crystal ball, but that's not even the right word either. That's they're predicting. If you had the power to inject into this, what is a any possible way for an off ramp for this to happen? Is it from somebody that's not even associated with any of these forces to try to uh, inject themselves into it and bring some sanity to it? What is a possibility to, to off ramp before this really goes south that it can't be controlled? The problem is that the, there's no one who has leverage over the United States except for Israel be through their lobby. Uh, so the political, right? So maybe you get out of this election season and maybe the Americans are a little bit more flexible, but there is no one who has leverage over the United States. Uh, and that's the problem here. Uh, you do not, you, you could say, hey, we, could China come in, a nation like China? Could, could Brazil, could you have a, a, a regional uh, effort uh, could, uh, where you have nations like Turkey and Egypt uh, intervene? Uh, and, and, and try and bring about some type of uh, de-escalation, um, <clears throat> you know, but but no one has leverage over the U.S. And so the U.S. and Israel are able to thumb their nose at the world. And, you know, for their constituencies, for, you know, who they speak to, who they represent, that's OK, because in their ideologies and whether it's the American exceptionist ideology or the fortress Israel iron wall ideology of Israel, uh, it's us against the world. It, yeah. There's there's religious aspects of it that make us exceptional or make us God's chosen people. So of course, this is what this is what religious history has taught us. Those who are chosen are always up against seemingly invincible odds, right? And so Fortress Israel, that's a manifestation of destiny. Right? You know, and so with that type of of of, of thinking, that type of passion, yeah. And then as well, too, it, it's what's best uh, for various established interests uh, in terms of supporting Israel. Well, that means other interests uh, may not who, you know, I'm, I'm talking at the like the elite level. Right. So why why are you seeing corporations continue to go along with this? Why are universities going along with this? You know, why is there not more pushback at that, you know, uh, elite level of of you know, again, those, those institutions, the establishment, uh, corporations, universities, uh, banks, et cetera. Well, because those other established interests, those other elite, in, you know, institutional levels, 
uh, who are benefiting from this. Well, the way these things work is that, look, if, if those elite established institutions to your left and your right, those adjacent to you, if it's good for them, well, it's probably good for you too. So, you know, they look and these corporations look and they see what's happening to the universities being dragged through the mud over right. this, university presidents being forced to resign. They see that there are these hedge fund managers who are all upset about it and they're the ones leading the charge against these university presidents. And so you're the your corporations and you say, you know what? This is nothing that we need to stick our neck out on. Nobody say anything about it. And if you no. do, you're fired. Right. And, and so this is this this provides that inertia for support. Right. And so because when people like us, we look at it and we say, why? How can they go along with this? How can how come American Airlines is still flying to Tel Aviv? How is this possible? How are they supporting this? Well, that's the pressure that they feel they are under to continue to go along. And so your point, though, is that, yeah, who could come in and intercede? I don't know, because I don't know who has the leverage over the Americans right. besides the Israeli lobby. They don't. They don't. And, and that's why it, it is just so anguishing to me and angering that if we had some moral leadership right. and not not tied to cash anywhere, but somebody who actually said we're going to do the right thing. Here's the perversion of all this, Matt is that the very people who are funding this and who are putting pressure on not doing anything to say no to Israel are actually laying the foundation for the harm of Israel, for the right, harm right. of the Jews. They are right. not protecting them. They are setting the seeds because all the rest of the world who sees this is just feeling with more and more anger, obviously in the region they are, and they are sowing the seeds for future conflict that nobody wants to undo because everybody wants to use more violence. And if at this moment, right now, as we're making this tape, if we had the chance to say, all right, calm the jets here, we could slowly lower the temperature. There could be no war in Lebanon. There could be no war against Iran. There could be no more people dying in the Gaza Strip. All these things could be settled. And over time, and it would take time, then the, the Jewish people would also be safer long term. But all, that takes firm leadership right now and no one in the United States is willing to put it. All they keep doing is trying to not make other people angry and keep the cash flowing. That's the hard truth, whether anybody wants to hear it or not. And it just angers me because so many people are going to pay with their lives for this unwillingness to see things as they are. This is this is uh, what happens with empires and vassal states. Very often throughout history, you see examples of this where uh, vassal states will try and do more than they should, will become greedy because they feel they have the empire's backing, right? Because we can get, so you see in a sense of, of what happens after the First World War, where uh, as uh, uh, Jewish colonists, Jewish settlers are settling in Israel, following the Balfour Declaration, following the British government saying, this is what we're gonna do, we're gonna give this land to the Jewish people. Uh, they become greedy. And they want to take more because they know they have the British Empire behind them. Yeah. And the same thing, too, in the modern era. They know they have the Americans behind them. So, you know, uh, Smotrich and Ben uh, hey, you know, Netanyahu and Gallant, all these people, they know ultimately the Americans are behind them and they can do what they want. Look, if you can kill 117 children a day, every day, for 104 days now, 105 days now, and they keep sending you bombs, you can do whatever you want. And they know that. Yeah, and that is the truth. Even though, as you as you so importantly point out, Danny, this in not in the long term, in the midterm. And you know, I mean, in, in a few years, the consequences of this for Israel are gonna be drastic. It's strategically, this is so insipid, this is so dumb. But in the short term, politically, this is what's best, you know, for both the Israelis in power. And for the Americans in power. power. Yeah, that's just how it is. Yeah. Well, Matt, uh, thanks for laying this out in a rather succinct way. Uh, we are going to continue to follow this, and we're going to continue calling out things as they are. I don't care if anybody likes it or not. These are the realities. We care so much about the Jewish people. We care about the Palestinian people. We care about all of the individuals, uh, the civilians in this entire region and in America, and for Americans who could get drawn into a war. And it just... All we're going to do is continue to call out the truth and, and just pray to God that at some point, somebody with power stands up and does the right thing. But until then, we're going to continue having you on and uh, sharing your views because we're very grateful to have it. All right. Thanks, Danny.
All right. And we thank you guys too. Uh, we've got some more shows coming up later this afternoon. You won't want to miss those uh, because we are going to continue to be just like this, unintimidated and uncompromised on bringing you the truth so that you can make sense of your world around you and hold people accountable by saying stuff like this. So you see before it happens, when it does happen, then people need to be held accountable so that it doesn't happen again in the future. That's what we're trying to do here because ultimately folks, we're in this together. We're on your side. Thanks. And we will see you on the next episode of Daniel Davis Deep Dive.